Tai neprižatų vienu su vaišiais. Čia vis tekstas nedaryti. about the program. I think it was very new and original in general because I didn't hear anything about something similar before. I like that there is a seminars, there is a friendly mentors, everyone helps us to grow our idea. The program gave some experience how to work on a business idea in a very systematic way. I've learned that business is not some kind of scary thing but something that you can learn and get good at. I think the best uh, thing about futurepreneurs where the chance to work with the people who have a lot done in business. The experience of the mentors, they had a very wide amount of knowledge that they could share with us. Probably I liked most people and the program, mentoring and meetings. I would definitely recommend uh, futurepreneurs to my friend, especially for those who have a lot of passion for their idea. For sure, for everybody who wants to start uh, in a startup or they're thinking about their own idea or their own company. So I would really recommend that. Fun startup experience, growing people, improvement, knowledge, ideas, teamwork, motivation, fulfillment. Good morning, good morning. It's so great to be here in such amazing space, surrounded by beautiful nature and by inspiring happy faces. My name is Ekaterina Bitus, and the main fact that you need to know about me today that 10 months ago, I have changed my career, and as a result, my life forever. <laughs> and started to build bridges between Swedbank Lithuania and startups and Tinder. And I'm so glad that Futurepreneurs invited me to join the program as a mentor, as a moderator for today. So for the guests in the auditorium, Futurepreneurs is a sustainability pre-acceleration program organized by Sunrise Valley, uh, uh, <laughs> sorry, Sunrise, Sunrise Valley Science and Technology Park. Since 2017, Futurepreneurs has received over 1,000 applications to join the program. 60 teams have completed it, presented their ideas in final events, and won 24 awards. And let me start with the thank you words. First of all, in <clears throat> uh, on behalf of the Sunrise Valley uh, Science and Technology Park, I would like to say a great thank you for our main partner, Svedvang, for trusting in this program, for Gediminas Technical University for hosting us here, <laughs> and of course for all the other partners for their help to support impact-driven businesses. So, before we jump into official welcome word, I would like us to do one thing. Let's pick up our phones. On the screen you should see the website where you should enter uh, the code. This code will appear in the upper corner of the screen during the presentations. And you know, the quite, I think, uh, I think quite important skill is to ask interesting questions, and this skill will serve you as a young growing business, future entrepreneurs and startups, I hope. So, let's try today to, uh, to do this, to ask interesting questions for our, uh, for our speakers, and um, let us jump into welcome world. Let me invite on the stage a great leader, <laughs> A wonderful woman, a perfect, I think, mentor, speaking about women leadership, business entrepreneur, CEO of Svetbank Lithuania, Davila Grigiana. 
Please welcome. Good morning. It's really great to see you all, and I congratulate everyone on this wonderful first day of Futurepreneurs. Uh, first of all, I must, uh, I must say that uh, we are extremely excited to be the partners of this program. It's the first time we're doing it, and I hope that we can really contribute uh, a lot with our experience and uh, guide you through with our best knowledge. But let me tell you why. <laughs> why are we so excited uh, about this? So first of all, of course, this is a program designed for future entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurship is something that we really need to foster in our society, build on, because it is one of the biggest things behind the economic growth. That's clear for each bank, and we really are appreciative we can uh, participate in this process of creating future entrepreneurs. But the key thing uh, that I think is most important today, and we hear more and more of it, is uh, also a key thing for us as a bank, it's sustainability. As we all know, back in 2015, United Nations uh, wrote a wonderful Sustainable Development Goal program. 17 sustainable goals are here for you to see, in case you have not seen them before, and get acquainted with. Um, I think it's a very important new trend that is happening in the world, new change. And uh, we at the bank already see that we are in the core of this change. Um, the last five years, I think, were not the same. Uh, if you talk about uh, the first uh, four years after 2015, we saw a lot of uh, general discussions, but uh, not clear understanding what is sustainability. I think last year is a real kickoff year that everybody started having global conversations about what do we need to do to, to have a better life. And I think the examples of the global leaders like Microsoft who came out within recent weeks and said that they will actually uh, go uh, carbon footprint negative. What does it mean? I could not understand it myself first. It means that they're not going to make sure their carbon neutral at the moment of operation now, but we will go back all the years to the past since the time the company was created and will reimburse for this carbon footprint. It's a promise we made publicly and I'm quite sure we will achieve it in the upcoming years. So this is really inspiring. But we don't need to look that far. Actually, not many people maybe notice, but even today in the banks there is a big transformation. Last year, at Swedbank Investment Funds, uh, which is the biggest uh, pension fund manager in Lithuania, we made a decision that we are going sustainable. And within one year, uh, about 30%, 340 million euros to be exact, uh, of investments were directed towards more sustainable investments already. So for you, as a future entrepreneur, it's uh, very important to understand that this trend is happening we will have upcoming regulations. All business will have to transform to become sustainable. And you have an exceptional chance to build a sustainable business. So please do it. Enjoy the program, uh, upcoming three months of discussions, the panels, the great, wonderful speakers who are coming from all over the world today. And I really hope that you can contribute to not only more sustainable, uh, uh, not only more entrepreneurial Lithuania, but also to a much more sustainable world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Davila. Um, the next speaker with a bright shining smile straight from the sunny California. It's your first time in Lithuania and in Vilnius. Charlotte Danielson, a CEO at Silicon Vikings. I bet we have heard about Silicon Valley. And Silicon Vikings is 45,000 network which connects Nordics and Baltics innovations with Silicon Valley and vice versa. And Charlotte is as well serving as an ambassador for the MIT Technology Review Innovators under 35 Europe. And there is as well one amazing thing that she is 
bringing us this year. Uh, she has managed to bring a Startup World Cup competition uh, to Nordic and Baltics in 2020. So today she will talk about why impossible is just a dare. So I believe this very inspiring presentation. Please welcome Charlotte Danielson, CEO of Silicon Vikings. Please. Good morning. Thank you all so much for having me here. I'm very honored to be here. Um, impossible is just a dare is the topic today because this wonderful Futurepreneurs uh, program is going to teach you all of the mechanics and the basics of what you need to, to build a successful startup. So what I was hoping to contribute was actually a, a deeper understanding of the mindset that you really need to build a successful company. Um, normally, when I start a presentation, I sort of rattle off my education and credentials and so forth, and that's how I introduce myself. But I wanted to, to take a little bit more personal approach and go through my life in a way that shows that this whole uh, impossible is just a dare is really, has always been more of a, a life motto for me. And then we're going to go through and actually go through the steps or the, the things involved in, in the mindset and what, what is required for it. So I was born in Sweden, moved to the US when I was three years old. Um, coming from Sweden, my parents, of course, had no idea about the US educational system and what a huge gap there is uh, in the different levels of it. So if any of you have seen uh, American movies where you see the, the high school that's all run down with the the gang <laughs> people in it and weapons and all of that. Well, that was my life. That was the school district I ended up with at the very, very bottom uh, of, of the school district types. And that, uh, based on the statistics, um, I was supposed to be both illiterate, as you see, and not able to count. Um, the school districts do not release those lower school districts, don't let you switch to another uh, district. So the first thing that, that I did right around age 10, uh, was say, okay, this isn't going to work. It's getting scarier and scarier as you kind of move up the levels. Um, and I figured out a way when they said it was impossible to transfer out uh, how to do it at 10 years old. And this was before the internet, so this involved a lot of calling and talking and really uh, asking questions and figuring it out. So there was a little loophole I found, which was that uh, the high school I was designated to go to didn't have an orchestra. So if they didn't have a program that you needed and showed you were good at, um, you were allowed to be released. So of course, I learned to play the violin <laughs> and transferred based on that. Worked really hard in high school after that. Uh, we ended up being the first in my family to go to college, including extended family. Uh, father had just gone through seven years of school. My mother had gone through nine and ended up going to the number one public university in the US, which is Berkeley. Worked really hard there again, uh, went to Stanford for law school. Uh, that should be the end of the story, more or less, and had a, a straight, perfect career path after that. But no story uh, of a woman <laughs> is really complete without a, a big smack of, of sexism happening in the middle of that. So <laughs> in law school, I got pregnant with my first child and then ultimately my second. Um, and it is in the US, and I'm sure everywhere in the world primarily, uh, as a, a top-ranking school, you're not as serious if you're pregnant. Um, having babies in school is something that you don't do. You don't have babies until you hit your 40s or so if you're really a professional woman. And so I went in to sign up for um, classes, or sorry, interview sessions at the uh, university with firms that were recruiting, because that was the path you were supposed to take, large firm, law firm recruitment. When I went in there to sign up, like you were supposed to be able to do, the center of the director came over, because I had my baby in the stroller, and came over and said, no, 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 no. That, that's not for you, you're not qualified to do that, really. Come here, let's sit down and have a chat, and we can talk about what your options are. She basically said, even though I was graduating from one of the best law schools in the US, that I could, my best path and really only option was to try and get some part-time contract work um, for a solo practitioner somewhere in the region. 
I went home and did not respond bravely like I should have. That was not a how dare you say that to me moment. It ended up being, of course, I cried for three days, <laughs> thinking I had completely wrecked my life. And then around the third day, I thought a second and thought, wait a second. She didn't know my name when I walked in there. She didn't know my grades. She never asked me what my experience was. The only thing that made her say that was this baby. And I thought, OK, there's some merit. Like in what she's saying, it means that the large law firms are looking at this a lot the same way. I still wanted to have the career that I wanted to have, decided that I was going to do that anyway, and wasn't going to let that stop me. So my original plan had been to uh, go work at a large firm for a few years and then start my own practice. So I thought, I'm just going to start my own practice right away. I can do this, no problem. <laughs> Uh, so with two little babies, $200,000 of debt, school debt, uh, I started my own practice. And uh, has gone very well for the last 22 years. Just to show you a little bit, this is a, a picture of me with a California Supreme Court justice on the same panel. This is also a session here with, uh, uh, on a session asking about uh, a roundtable discussion with California legislative members asking about what can be done in tech to uh, improve it from a regulatory perspective, make California a more attractive place. And then I started working for Silicon Vikings, uh, again, as a way of just sort of giving back. So I like to say I have two full-time jobs because I do, but this is one that I find very, very inspiring because all of you entrepreneurs are just amazing people. When I took over a little over five years ago, um, it had been growing for about 18 years and uh, was at 20,000. I managed to quickly bring that up. I increased the network size to over 45,000 and also increased the level of influence. Since that time, I've been asked to talk about how to connect uh, the diaspora, tech diaspora abroad, uh, with the local community in Europe by the European Commission, invited to talk about that, best practices for that. This one doesn't show. Anyway, the first thing there was, last year we had uh, Reed Smith, sorry, Reed Hoffman, the uh, CEO and founder of LinkedIn, actually used Silicon Vikings as an example of what the Nordics should be doing to uh, advance uh, in technology faster. We also did, this is a picture from two weeks ago where uh, I was able to, I've been running these Startup World Cup competitions. We ran one in Utah with over 3,000 people at it with Mark Zuckerberg as a speaker. So just a little way of saying that it doesn't matter what life throws at you if you just sort of decide to do what you want to do and what you believe you should be doing, it's absolutely possible. So how do you actually meet the challenge? Wanted to break it down in a couple different steps for you. Now you have this big insurmountable goal. You have it here in both ways. These are very uh, lofty goals. Some would say this is all impossible. We are just uh, on this, this track that it can't be fixed. I absolutely don't believe that because we have so many amazing entrepreneurs with wonderful ideas. And all of you out there are going to be able to solve all of these things. As Steve Jobs put it, this is one of my favorite things, uh, those who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world usually do. So if you believe it, you can make it happen. One of the keys to this is really to follow your unique passion. A lot of us look at uh, situations and think, OK, this is what an entrepreneur looks like. I don't look like an entrepreneur. I don't feel like an entrepreneur. Uh, I don't have the same kind of background or experience, especially as we've seen these success stories come up. You kind of try and model yourself after them. That isn't what you should be doing. You should be looking at what in your life is unique about you and your experiences and your viewpoints. You look at, for example, most people who are successful entrepreneurs, they really are doing it to change the world or to implement something in their vision of how the world should be. 
It's not about the money. This is a prime example of it, right? You have Elon Musk, first company, Zip2, acquired by Compaq. He personally made 22 million. Most of us would say at that point, yes, I did it, I am a success. I don't need to do anything else. What does he do though? He doesn't stop there. It isn't about the money, he takes half pretty much, <laughs> of what he's earned and decides to risk that all and goes for another company, right? He starts uh, X.com, merges with the company that ultimately had the PayPal tool. He then receives 165 million personally when that's acquired by eBay. And that's the last we ever heard of him, right? Yeah, no. He has a vision in his head that is definitely guiding him that has nothing to do with anything except for he's driven to uh, achieve and make the world what he thinks it should be. We all have that in us in different ways, maybe not, we're not all Elon Musk, but we have it to some degree. Mark Zuckerberg looked completely insane after building up a company from the ground up, being really successful, gets an offer for $1 billion, and says, no thanks, right? Half of his company probably thought he was insane. He had half the management leaving, going, this guy's nuts, I'm out of here. This makes no sense. Um, he says, back at the time, he said, it's not because of the amount of money. For me and my colleagues, the most important thing is that we create an open information flow for people. Having media corporations owned by conglomerates is just not an attractive idea for me. So for him, the vision is much more important than the money. It's about achieving something. And your thing doesn't have to be the same. <laughs> it just needs to be whatever your personal drive and mission is. It can be even on a smaller scale than that. You take the uh, founder of Pinterest. You basically had a nerdy little boy who liked to collect bugs and cards and things that I'm sure he was made fun of as a kid. Loved doing that. Found another guy loved collecting things too. So what do they do? They use that passion and idea and come up with Pinterest and find out, yeah, there are a lot of other people who like the same kind of things. Next thing, think, be the fish. What do I mean by that? You need to be this guy right here. Always picture yourself as this and aim for it. This guy, he's completely jumping, he's all in, you can't see where he's going. He probably doesn't know either. He has something in his mind of where he's going. In terms of thinking outside the box, if you look at the cup as the box, he's not just thinking outside the box. He's knocking the whole thing down and over as he's going. Different ways of doing all in. We saw with Elon Musk, for example, he's sticking all his money in there and letting it ride. Uh, the, the founder here of Pinterest, different way of doing it. If you don't have lots of money to put into it. Well, he personally wrote letters to the site's first 7,000 uh, users, giving him his personal phone number, saying, uh, meeting with someone, and basically meeting with some of them and saying, you know, what do you think of the product? What are you doing? I really want to know. Who spends the time doing that? That is someone who is 100% in and giving it his all. This is sort of more of what your life looks like when you are an entrepreneur. And it's something that you have to look at as exciting and challenging. I had a, a young entrepreneur, female entrepreneur, say to me one time, and it's always stuck with me. She said, my parents were doctors. That was the track I was on. Was in college, finished college, supposed to do that. Studied biochemistry or something. And that was the path she was supposed to be on. And she said, but then I realized I could see my whole life, my life after medical school, my career, my children, my everything, everything all the way to retirement and death. And that was so boring. Why would anyone want to do that? I don't want to know what my life is going to be. I want it to be fun and mysterious. And it's okay if it's challenging in the middle of that, but like, Let's do this, let's have an interesting life. You only get one. Facing the things, now this maze process, 
Uh, entrepreneurship isn't always highs, there are a lot of lows, and it's a lot really scary, right? And face, you can be scared. A lot of people look like they're not when they're doing this, but really it's be afraid and do it anyway. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt said, you gain strength, courage, and confidence by every experience in which you really stop to look fear in the face. You must do the things you think you cannot do. And every time you do that, you get a little stronger and a little braver. Next thing, uh, become a, a sponge. What do I mean by that? It means never stop learning. Some of us battle with uh, being a perfectionist, thinking we have to know everything before we start. As an entrepreneur, that's not going to work because you will never actually get off the ground and get going. Um, just like you're going to learn about minimum viable product, well, there's this thing sort of called just-in-time learning, that you need to know what you need to know in time to know it. You don't need to know what you're going to need to know three years from now. At that stage, it's good enough if you know right now. And just, you have to continuously be learning and, and pick up what you need as you need it. The other thing, confidence without arrogance, I think, is one of the, the keys to this. Um, and what I mean by that is, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room, right? You're not challenging yourself enough, you're not challenging your business enough. You really need to kind of always be stepping out and looking at, wow, what's that company doing? Oh, what's this, what's this thing, what's that? Um, and that's something that is sort of core to what most of the founders, the really successful founders do. Steve Jobs said, uh, it doesn't make sense to hire smart people and tell them what to do. We hire smart people so they can tell us what to do. Hard to imagine anyone telling him what to do, but <laughs> that is still sort of his philosophy, and it makes a lot of sense. He's basically saying uh, the point there is Never think you're the smartest person around because there is always someone who is better and smarter at something. And if you're arrogant, you're going to be threatened by that. If you're confident, you're going to think, wow, this person is amazing. I need them on my team. And it's going to be for the betterment of your company. Fourth thing, network 24-7. I know you all hear this all the time and no one really believes it. We did a study a few uh, years ago about the entrepreneurs who had come from the Nordics and set up in the US. And the most common comment about what surprised you about the US was how important networking was. <laughs> and they were like, well, I mean, people always told me that, but like, I didn't understand ever really how important that was, um, the extent of it. So one of the things, you need to do with that and why I say 24-7 is you're not just building a business in isolation. You're going to need people around you to support that business. You're going to need a, a network to help you fulfill the vision of the business. You need to be building that simultaneously with your business because it takes a long time to effectively really grow a strong network. So you should keep that in mind all the time. And I hear a lot of people saying, I don't have time to do that. I have to run my business. It's part of your business, and that's how you need to think of it. Um, there's no one who has really succeeded without help from somebody. We typically hear the story of Bill Gates as being, he's completely self-made, he went out there, and he sort of uh, made the connections he needed with IBM and got this great contract just through perseverance. Well, not actually true. His mother was a very influential woman. Uh, she was on the board of United Way, where the CEO of IBM was also a board member. She talked a lot about her son and this new cool company he was building. She, he made the she made the introduction for him. Yes, brilliant guy, yes, he carried it out, but everybody needs an intro or a connection. And I ask here, uh, what are you doing to pay it forward? Because that is the root of really effective networking. When you're talking about building your network, you shouldn't be looking at it as, what can people do for me? I need to get people into my network that I can sort of directly benefit from. 
the most effective way to build a solid network is really to be the person who is the one doing the giving. You get a better uh, reputation, you build a reputation as a connector between people, and then by doing this sort of constantly through your, your startup careers, you end up being someone who is viewed as, as both being um, sort of caring about others in the community, caring about other startups, being sort of a team player, all of that. And when you need something, they're actually gonna help you. Fifth thing here is embrace failure. This is kind of a, we all hear about, you know, Silicon Valley, oh, everybody likes to fail. It's a good thing, it's a positive thing. It's not exactly the way that it sounds in practice. It's not really that Silicon Valley is sort of celebrating people just uh, being horrible at things. It's not, it's really the philosophy of um, either I never fail, I either learn or I succeed. But learning is part of the failure. So if you're not learning from the failure, it's just failure. The point is you need to learn and then it's positive failure if you're figuring out what happened and you're constantly learning and you're trying to fix that. Uh, Albert Einstein said, in the middle of every difficulty lies opportunity. Always true, you just have to look for it. So sometimes that's the start of a company. If you look at Airbnb, for example, I just sort of made up this, this scenario of how it happened, the dialogue, these aren't the exact words, but basically you have two designers in San Francisco going, my goodness, it's so expensive here in San Francisco. We don't have money for our rent, what, what are we gonna do? We can't pay rent. And then one of them says, hey, there's a big design conference in the town this week and all the hotels are booked, so we could maybe, we could just like get some air mattresses <laughs> and rent those out. Maybe it could work. Hey, yeah, okay, we'll put together a, a kind of bad website. We'll, we'll offer to cook them breakfast too. Uh, then they're so excited because they get three people to rent these air mattresses. And from that step, they're suddenly saying, wow, this could be big, this is the best idea ever. Three people did this. And then they're like, well, wait, we're designers. How are we gonna do this? Oh, we need a computer scientist. Wasn't our old roommate a computer scientist? Let, let's call him up, let's see if we can get him on board too. Uh, so from that adversity, Airbnb happened. Making decisions is important, right? You failure in a different way. So YouTube, uh, love the fact that originally it started as a dating website with the coolest slogan ever, tune in, hook up. <laughs> they made the decision at that point. That was what they were planning to do. They realized uh, fairly quickly after desperately trying everything that this isn't working. <laughs> But they did see that people were posting other things. There was actually a thing about they, they put ads in Craigslist offering to pay women to post on there to actually get something going. That's how desperate they were. And then they decided, so they kept, if they'd kept on that path, it would have failed completely. But suddenly they're like, okay, this isn't working. But they see some people are adding other content and say, all right. Well, maybe we should just let people post whatever they want instead of forcing this to be a website and see if that works. And that worked. So this is it, right? This is kind of the idea here. <laughs> Road of life is paved with flat squirrels who couldn't make a decision. You have to keep that in mind when you're an entrepreneur. You have to be not afraid of failing because if you're afraid of failure, you're gonna hesitate and you're not gonna make a decision, which is ultimately gonna wipe you out. So one way or another, you have to decide, okay, we're like YouTube did, okay, we're switching to this. Um, this is another example here, Twitter. They originally started as Odeo. Um, they were planned to be a source to find, make, and subscribe to podcasts. They were on their way, they thought this was the best idea ever. Uh, and then Apple introduces iTunes. <laughs> And that would have wiped them out. They were smart enough at that point, they made a decision. They were like, oh no, what should we do? Should we compete with Apple or should we try something different? They made the smart decision to go a different route and we have the, the Twitter that we have today because of it. But they made a choice. Then you also have the scenario of knowing never give up. There are some situations where you need to pivot. But there are also some situations where you need to make the decision that no, 
we're not going to give up. You see, I love this picture. Always the frog is sort of desperately, <laughs> he he's normally would be out of it, but he's like, no, I'm not giving up until the very end. And the best example of that is Angry Birds. 51 unsuccessful games. Should they have stopped doing what they were doing? Most people would probably say yes. These founders were like, no, we're going to get this. This is going to happen. Let's just try one more time. And you know that all those 51 times were probably, let's just do it one more time. Let's just do it one more time. And they did. And the, that time, the 52nd time, they got their successful game. So sort of in closing, the last thing here is, the final thing is make magic with all those things that you're doing. And what do I mean by that? Engineering is the closest thing to magic that exists in the world, is what Elon Musk said. So when we're looking at solving all of these huge problems here from the blocks, <laughs> think about that. Some people would say it's going to take a miracle to, to get all this done. Like, there's no way. Well, we have that miracle or magic. And it's up to you to sort of to implement it and make it happen. Thank you. If you are the smartest person in the room, you are in the wrong room. How cool is that? I'm going to steal it. Please stay for a few moments on a stage. We have some questions. And uh, I believe that our squishy microphone is ready to be thrown to the person who would like to ask the question from the seat. But while you are thinking about smart questions, so I have interesting ones uh, in the Slido platform. So, could you please point a few, uh, a few, at least a few points, how Silicon Valley startup ecosystem differs from the European one? And maybe you can even say, tell us which is your favorite. I don't have a favorite. I'll start with that because I think each one is very unique, and that's what makes them special. Um, Silicon Valley, I think the the thing that makes it the most special uh, is this pay it forward culture, and one of the things that uh, I don't think gets highlighted in that and in, in the understanding of that is I think it's actually really based in not so much like this altruistic um, I want to give back exactly. It's built on this uh, intellectual curiosity. The reason it's so open is really because you have all of these brilliant people who aren't arrogant but just confident and they're like, oh, what is he doing? That's really cool. I want to hear that. And even when you're talking about uh, professional, you know, experienced, successful entrepreneurs, they want to hear what the new startup guy is thinking about and, and wanting to do because he's just kind of intellectually curious and always will be. And that is, I think, the biggest strength of, of Silicon Valley. And that's something that Europe definitely needs more of, just, just sort of that... Uh, complete um, interest and passion in, 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 I see it growing more and more, the, the sort of pay it forward idea, uh, but it isn't as, as developed. Thank you for sharing. I think it's up to us to improve uh, the European image. So next time you visit us, uh, you will see more compliments <laughs> to our ecosystem. And a classical question. I think the guys just wanted to know your opinion on that. So if a startup is not generating any profit in the first five years, is it still a startup or just a loss-making company? Um, well, I, I, I mean, I think it really depends, right? <laughs> uh, some companies, there, there's really, I mean, you see from the example there of, of Angry Birds, like, I don't know, was that a failure? Yeah, it was until they weren't. <laughs> so it's really about, um, is the company something that you really believe in? And sometimes it's the, uh, I don't think anyone else's timelines are sort of that there can be artificial timelines imposed on any company, that it really is very individual, just like the entrepreneurs running it. And they have to sort of decide if their vision really is something that should happen and be implemented and something they believe in strongly enough to keep doing. What it does signal, though, is maybe your goal is great, but your plan's not so good. So maybe it's time to sort of look at what you're doing and if there are ways to sort of look at how you can change it. Okay, thank you so much. So, 
Hope to see you next time on the stage, as promised. So, any questions? More? No? Thank you. So, let's give a warm round of applause then to Charlotte. <laughs> Okay, so the next speaker is as well a shining person with a bright smile, which, which brights the grayest day. And uh, I'm starting to get a feeling that he's my personal mentor on sustainability matters. It's Alex Cave, co-founder and partner for Catalysta Ventures. And I think that his statement is written here in the script for me, that as a serial entrepreneur and investor, he believes that businesses with meaning and impact have a bright future ahead. So please welcome Alex Gibb, Catalyst Ventures. Here you are, there's the slider, if you need it. Thanks very much, mm -hmm. Katerina. I think uh, I just wanted to pick up on one, one thing that, uh, that Charlotte uh, shared in, in her slides, uh, and I really like that, uh, the picture of the squirrel. So if you saw the picture of the squirrel, uh, and that was that, you know, there are lots of uh, flat squirrels who were there who didn't make that decision. Um, and there was one really cool, very unusual, and if you're a vegan in the room, then maybe not for you, uh, startup in the, in the UK, and it was called roadkill.com. And it was a guy who saw that there were lots of animals being hit on the road and he decided to set up a website just to go around and then take the, the animals, the dead animals from the road, cook them, eat them, and rate them. So it was a very unusual kind of uh, uh, style there. So that go, goes to show that uh, you know, when it comes to pivoting and taking new ideas to different directions, it can be in absolutely any, any way you want to do it. So yes, uh, a small diversion there at the, uh, at the start, um, but uh, as, as introduced, I'm Alex from, from Catalyst Adventures, and I'm here to talk to you today about meaning and impact. And what do I believe in? Well, I really truly believe that businesses can have a positive impact on people, on the planet, and on profit as well. So this is what we do at Catalyst Adventures. We're encouraging companies uh, to actually build businesses from the start that have a positive impact on all three areas. So what I'll do is, is actually share uh, how you can tackle some global challenges as well. We've already had the introduction to, to the SDGs and we'll go beyond that. Hopefully we'll talk about a few practical tools uh, and examples of what we're doing to, uh, to contribute towards this as well. So a little bit first of all about uh, Catalyst Adventures. So we are uh, the first um, hybrid uh, accelerator and private equity fund in the Baltics, uh, which is really focusing on building startups and supporting and creating startups that are having a positive impact on all three areas, on the three Ps, so people, profit, and, and planet. Uh, we also work uh, with two other areas. So one of those is sustainability advisory. So we're doing quite a lot of work. We've actually done a hackathon in, uh, in this very room here. So it's, it's really nice to be back uh, in this space. Uh, and we also do sustainability advisory. Sustainability is something that's very close to our hearts, something that we've been working with for, for quite a few years now. And we'd love to encourage more businesses and companies and individuals like yourselves uh, to engage with more, uh, especially here in the, uh, in the Baltics. A couple of uh, examples uh, to make this really concrete uh, to understand what we actually do. Uh, so first up uh, on the sustainability advisory, uh, we've been working with a Kona space company called Our Studios. Uh, so they're a sustainable fashion brand that are really focusing on the Scandinavian market. Uh, so we've been doing advisory work with them to help them to understand what does sustainability mean in fast fashion? What does uh, it mean for their operations, for their sales, for their partners, and how can they make themselves more sustainable and have a bigger impact? So that was, a, that was a really interesting project that we did last year. Uh, on the startup side, um, tingly.com is actually uh, based very close to here, uh, in, uh, near, near the tech park in, in Antakalnis. And uh, Tingly is the uh, world's first um, experienced gift box. Uh, and I think this is also fantastic inspiration that we can, you, you can uh, build a business based here in Lithuania and to date, we've sold to 121 countries around the world. So, you know, with a small team here in Vilnius, you can create a, a global brand selling all around the, the world. 
And, and Tingley, I think, is an especially nice one because it's really founded on meaning uh, and, and, and the, the subsequent impact. And it's all about how can we bring more happiness to people? And bringing happiness through an experience gift. So not giving another you know, pencil case or, or mug or something or you know, a pair of socks for somebody's birthday, but how can you actually give an experience that it actually brings happiness uh, and positive memories for, for a lifetime? Uh, and then you know, the, 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 the other, other side of that is then actually reducing consumption and having that, uh, that impact. So that's been something that's been extremely rewarding uh, as a co-founder and co-creator uh, to really uh, build that um, in, on the startup uh, area. And then on the, on the innovation side, we've been working with uh, basketball club uh, Jalgiris, which I guess um, pretty much everybody uh, has heard of. So we've been doing everything from, uh, from there on uh, from str uh, strategy, innovation strategy, to hackathons uh, and further development. And they're a, you know, a very ambitious organization, a really ambitious club, and they want to grow you know, not 5%, not 10%, but you know, 50 or 100% each, uh, each year. So how can we create a culture and how can we create an approach to help lift them up to, uh, to do that? So a couple of, uh, couple of simple examples on what we actually do on a day-to-day -day basis when we say that we believe in, in making this impact on people, profit, and, and planet. So what about meaning and, and greed, and how do all these things uh, come together? So I think, first of all, let me ask you, maybe think for yourself for a moment. Think of a company that is greedy. Think of a company that's greedy and is not doing the right thing. What's the first thing that comes to mind? Would anybody like to share? Yeah? Apple. Apple. Apple's a greedy company. Okay. T tell me more. example and, and, and one perspective on, uh, on how, how this company is being run and, uh, and, and what, it's, uh, what, they, what they're doing. I'm guessing you don't have an iPhone in your pocket. You don't have an iPhone. So you're actually you know, voting with your, with your pocket as well and saying, I don't believe in this company. I don't want to buy them and so on. You know, we've seen a few scandals uh, in Lithuania recently with, with companies that are, are doing things that are, let's say, not sustainable. Uh, you know, if we you know, we can think of countless examples of uh, pharma companies, of, uh, of other organizations that are either polluting rivers, that are doing uh, bad things. And, you know, as consumers, where does that take us? Does, will, will we continue to buy their products? Will we continue to support them? Then I think, as you said, you know, you want to actually vote with your, with your pocket and, uh, and, say, uh, and say no. Now, the, thing, the, the, the really interesting thing for me here is that the, the new breed of entrepreneurs in Lithuania, and, and I guess I'm looking at all of you here, uh, is that it's extremely positive that so many um, new entrepreneurs are actually coming to us and saying, yes, I would like to make money, but it's as important to have a positive impact. I don't just want to come and make a lot of money. I want to come and make money by doing something good. And that's exactly what we're saying that you can, you can have this meaning and, and you, can, you can make money, but when it's just about greed, this is not the, the sustainable way of building and managing businesses. A little bit about uh, the triple top line. So this is this, uh, the concept of people, profit, and, and planet. So uh, back, back, in the, um, back, back a few years ago, a lot of companies started talking about CSR, about uh, social responsibility, and it was really focused on how can we make our businesses less bad? So companies would start to say, you know, we, we've cut down X number of trees, we've, uh, we've done these bad things, but now we're going to make it better or we, we make it a little bit less bad. And slowly over time, these, these things become less bad, but, but ultimately the, 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 the result is, 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 is never kind of below zero. So I think Davila mentioned the, uh, the example this morning of Microsoft. Uh, them actually wanting to, to backdate and offset all of the carbon that they've used uh, since their inception. You know, if they'd done that from the beginning, that, that might be a quite a different uh, value proposition for, for customers as well. 
But what we're saying here is that if we start to think on the, on the top of the line, that by building businesses with this positive impact from the very beginning, then everybody wins and it's, it's sustainable for the company as well. So a little bit of uh, a little bit of background on inspiration for purpose. So you know maybe let's just have a quick show of hands. How many of you have clearly defined your sense of purpose? Why you would like to be an entrepreneur? Why you exist? Why would you like to create businesses? Okay, good. A couple of hands up at the back. Okay, some more here. It's okay. Don't be shy. I'm not going to ask you to stand up and explain it or sit down. Yeah, another one there. One or two here. Yeah, great. So, so this is uh, this is really uh, really good to hear. Uh, for me personally, uh, Simon Sinek has been a, a fantastic fantastic inspiration. Um, you might have seen his TED talk when he talks about the power of why. So it's talking much more about you know why you do something uh, rather than what you do. Uh, funnily enough, as you mentioned the the example of Apple, this is uh, this was actually Apple's example uh, that Sinek brought that you know people buy into Apple because they want to change the status quo. They believe in, 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 in making a difference. And the way that they do that is through design, through ergonomics, and making them beautiful, uh, beautiful to use. And as a result, the what is then, you know, the iPhone, the iPad, the, the MacBook, uh, or whatever the, the product is. And it's a very different uh, proposition when you're going to a consumer and saying, you know, buy into what I believe, not what I produce. So, uh, so this is really the, the inspiration that's been great. So you know, I encourage you, if you haven't seen that already, uh, do have a uh, look at Synex uh, at uh, TED Talk. Uh, we're also working with an organization in Sweden called Self Leaders. And Self Leaders uh, is also founded on purpose. It's a group of ex-McKinsey consultants uh, who have come together and want to help organizations and individuals to find their personal why. So this is something else we do working with entrepreneurs as a starting point is to understand, you know, what is it that drives you? What is it that's going to make you really fundamentally happy through building this business? So, so this is also our approach on, uh, on that side. So what about the challenges that, that face us? What are the, the things that are out there? Um, we've seen recently that the World Economic Forum has mentioned that the top five global risks are now related to the environment. So the top five global risks for business are related to the environment. And that's a combination of man-made, of natural, uh, whether it's migration uh, and so on. So there are a whole bunch of risks that are, that are out there. We've also been inspired by the Stockholm Resilience Center, which is a fantastic organization uh, which has created this map called the Planetary Boundaries. And they've tried to understand what are the different um, aspects of the global ecosystem that we need to take care of and, and, and actually manage. So, so they've, by, by mapping out the planetary boundaries, that they can, we can see what do we need to work with and, uh, and tackle. So ozone was one of the, the, the very first challenges that they, that they mapped as part of this exercise. And a lot of the initiatives that came out to actually reduce the, the spread of, uh, of, of aerosols uh, and harmful ozone harmful um, uh, sprays uh, was uh, emanated from uh, from this very first uh, study from the Stockholm Resilience Center. So I'd really encourage you to uh, to, to look at that as well. Um, but I think that the, the the important thing here is that this is not just about risks; that this is opportunities uh, for us uh, for us as well. And if you're if you're feeling overwhelmed that it's uh, that it's not actually possible. Uh, to, uh, to, to start and tackle some of these huge problems here in this room or as an individual, as a, as a startup, it is, it is possible and you can do something by starting really small. And this is what we try to do with, with Tingly. You know, how can we bring happiness? How can we spread happiness through experience gifting? How can we, we reduce material stuff? Another really good example in Lithuania at the moment is actually Zitty City. So this is the, you know, the last mile delivery company they have uh, decided that they want to solve this problem that a lot of CO2 emissions are actually coming from the last mile delivery from the shop to your home. And by putting people on bicycles and, and delivering this, they're actually having a very, uh, very positive impact. Uh, and now they're in a position where they're, they're ready to scale as well. So another exciting example coming out of, uh, of Lithuania. Talking more about the SDGs, uh, there's a really good app 
uh, called SDGs in Action. So you can have a look at that on the App Store or whatever the Android equivalent of uh, the App Store is. Um, it's a really good tool which helps you understand, you know, what are the, the 17 SDGs and by uh, by you doing your startup or developing your business, how are you contributing to one or several of these SDGs? So it's really encouraging when you actually start to look at, uh, you know, your own idea, your own business idea, and then you can think and look, you know, what am I contributing towards here? Is it climate change? Is it reducing inequality? Uh, is it affordable or green energy, clean energy? So you can actually start to very quickly connect personally and understand that, yes, you know, by me doing this startup, I can not only have a positive impact for, for doing something good myself, I can have an impact on the SDGs and on the, and the planet more, more widely as well. So I do encourage you to have a, have a look at the, uh, the app and see what you, can, uh, what you can do there. So talking about Catalyst Ventures, how do we measure our impact? Uh, so, so, what, so one of the things here, if we look at the, the planet, um, we actually offset all of our activities 200%. So I'm flying to Israel this afternoon for, a, for, a, for an event. Uh, so all of my travel for the last two years since we started has been offset 200%. And that's just something, that was sort of a hygiene factor that we felt that we needed to do to, to be credible in, uh, in, a, in our operations. We also work with a, a fantastic organization called Plastic Bank. Uh, which is an American company, and what they do is they uh, employ people in uh, developing countries to clean uh, plastic from rivers, to upcycle that plastic, and then actually resell that plastic at a premium, uh, and they help find the, the, the purchasers for that. So we're actually actively reducing the amount of plastic in rivers, and, and most of us know that you know, the big problem is, is plastic in the oceans, but the, the source of that plastic is the rivers. So how can we actually take a step back and, and be cleaning the oceans from, uh, from there? On the people side, we uh, participate in uh, ed educational events such as this, um, also with, uh, with uh, junior achievement. I think Angelica's somewhere, somewhere here in the room as well. Uh, we, uh, we look at the number of entrepreneurs that we've supported, at the number of people we've coached, we've mentored, we've, uh, we've developed over time. Uh, and also on the knowledge spread around, uh, around sustainability too. So one of the things, uh, and this is a shameless plug for a report that's, uh, that's due out this week, uh, we've just done a report on social enterprise in Lithuania. And what we looked at is that we have a lot of really good social entrepreneurs in Lithuania who want to do something good. They want to create a good uh, product that has a positive impact on society or, or the planet. Mo most often it's society. But the key thing is that very often they forget about the profit angle. They forget to, to make money, they forget to focus on actually generating enough revenue to keep the company alive and to scale it. So therefore, the, the, the impact is either small or, or even non-existent because a lot of these organizations continue to depend on public funding or grants. And this is not a sustainable business model. So again, this comes back to our triple top line approach where we want companies to have a positive impact on all three areas and by having the, the financial uh, aspect as well, the company can grow, they can grow further and they can have an even bigger impact. Uh, and then that talks a little bit more into then the, the, the profit angle for us. Uh, so as you, as, you, as you saw from the, the consulting angle, we, have, we do both the consulting and the investing in the, in the startups too. So that's how we measure our, our, our bottom line. So that's the triple top line approach. That's how we work with, uh, with that. A couple, uh, couple of small reflections. Uh, I think I would also agree with, with everything that uh, Charlotte said in, uh, in, 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 your, uh, in your takeaways as well. Uh, a slightly different angle here from uh, looking at this from our lens. We really believe that the best businesses actually have meaning built into them and then they can have impact. Very simple. It's possible to start small, but always having this view to scale. So whatever you're doing, start small, get something going, get some traction, and then uh, have that in, in mind. How can that be then scaled later on? The third thing, you know, consider your business and reflect on that through the PPP lens. Think about what is the impact on people? What is the impact on the planet? And what is the impact on profit? Understand and measure that impact. That's an important step there. And, uh, and to be transparent as well and share what you're doing. 
So as a, as a short sort of wrap up, uh, I said at the start that I, I believe that businesses can have, um, are, are capable of having and should have this positive impact on, on all three areas. I think you're, you're all in the room uh, because you want to, to have an impact of some, some sort or another. Uh, and again, this, this sense of looking, looking for meaning and trying to understand what's your purpose is a really great time to do that as you're, as you're beginning your, your entrepreneurial lives. And I wish a lot of you uh, actually do that. Um, yeah, and, uh, and I think really that, again, we, we've shown that you can tackle some of these global issues uh, here uh, in this room and, and beyond. And, uh, and I wish you good luck for, for doing that. Thank you. Uh, Alex, the audience has so many questions for so you. Questions. They're popping, and some of them are really personal. So, guys, <laughs> there will be a coffee break and networking session, so you will be able, I hope, Alex, you will stay for the, for the break. I can stay for the coffee yeah. break, that's So, fine. please stay for the coffee. Definitely, the audience needs to ask you so many things. But uh, let's uh, as well answer a, few as answer a few questions from the stage. So, there is a bunch of questions related with the sustainability and higher price of the product. Yep. About how to uh, become sustainable, how to make sustainability as a selling point for the customer. So, is there any kind of recipe? Uh, is there a recipe for charging more money to be more sustainable? Is that, is that the question? Is there a recipe to uh, run a successful business yeah. and sustainable business? Uh, yes. So, so I would say that um, we, we created one product last year uh, where we actually made this, this, this product essentially uh, sort of uh, very sustainable by building in carbon offset and uh, plastic reduction into the product. And, and what was really interesting is that we saw a, a, a new group of people who hadn't engaged with us at all before that were suddenly very interested in buying this. And they actually started to, to buy and spend money on the, on the product. Um, and, I th and I think there are a couple of, couple, of, couple of things to consider there. One is that the cost of, of carbon offset and, and actually doing something positive at a symbolic level is rapidly coming down. So that's making it much easier for businesses to be able to say, you know, take a step forward and say, you know, we want to, to have not just a, a negative, a zero impact, but actually a positive one uh, to do that. So I think it's really about building that into the business model and it is possible. Uh, what is the first thing which makes you understanding that this company is successful, or uh, sorry, is sustainable? <laughs> It's sustainable. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it really depends on the industry. If it's, uh, if it's uh, you know, in the processing industry or it's an e-commerce business or it's, uh, you know, something else, it's the, the first step to do is to come in and measure what they're doing. So we're always looking at sort of, you know, measure, understand, mm -hmm. and then start to manage. So it's looking at that in three levels. And it's only by starting off by measuring what you're doing, you can start to, to really understand it and then shape and drive and, and manage it from, from there. Thank you so much. One more tricky question, but I promise this is the last one. So uh, the audience is asking, what about the, uh, what is your opinion about the brands like H and M and Zara and the information which recently has showed in Garden? So are you aware about uh, the this that two factories in Myanmar had workers at um, uh, 14 years old laboring more than 20 hours per day? Yeah. yeah. So I think my first, uh, the, f the first thing that influenced me on this was there was a book in the late 1980s, uh, if anyone was born then, uh, called No Logo by Naomi Klein. And this was, uh, was really kind of the first big investigative journalist um, uh, expose of, 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 of what was happening in supply chains, in, uh, in, in, especially in Asia uh, back then. And um, I think that you know, with the rise of, of the internet, with, with the flow of information that's happening, it's much, much harder for companies to hide things like this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think the other positive thing that we're seeing is that more and more companies see the value in proactively uh, showing and publishing what they're doing and who's in their supply chain and, uh, and so on. If I can, uh, so, so, so yes, I'm, I'm aware of this. Uh, I think we're going in the right direction. Yes, we all want it to be much faster, but, but, but we're going there. Um, a quick story is that my sister-in-law, she went to North Korea on holiday a few years ago. And, uh, and she was taken to a textiles factory. Uh, yeah, it's a strange place to go for a holiday, I understand, but that's, that's another story. Uh, and she was uh, shown around a factory because they wanted to demonstrate how, how advanced their, their textiles were in North Korea. 
And, and as they were going around, it was a room full of, of women, exclusively women, and they were sewing labels into shorts for an Australian surfboard uh, company called Billabong, if you've heard of Billabong. So Billabong shorts are being made in North Korea, and she went and looked at the labels, and the label said, made in China. So it was North Korean women sitting in a factory, uh, sewing in labels saying, made in China. So you know this, this factor of actually being able to trust and believe in what you're told by the company is, is really difficult. But again, you know, we're going more and more in, in this direction of transparency, and I believe uh, we're, we're, we're getting there. Thank you so much. Let's make a round of applause for Alex. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I'm giving the microphone. Don't forget your things. Uh, there were several questions regarding the profitability and uh, how to start the startup or the company with uh, no money. So I believe that you know for sure what is the most challenging for entrepreneurs. So of course, raising the money. Of course, without it, we cannot lift company off the ground and um, and keep it running. So what to do? Uh, Luckily, the business angels are here to help, but how to choose the right investors? Does any, uh, every business needs an angel? So this and more other questions will be discussed in the upcoming panel discussion. And to, to moderate the panel discussion, I would like to invite on the stage Daiva Jankonskaita, the managing director of Lithuanian Business Angel Network, who will moderate the discussion. Please welcome Daiva. Good morning, how are you? Are you ready to moderate? Yes, of course, thank okay, you. Okay, so full speed ahead. Hello everyone, thank you for having us here. And uh, I will start actually with our guests. And I would like to invite our chairman of the board, Vladas Lashas, please. <laughs> Rita Sakos, please come here, our board member also. Arvid Ostromskis, please come here, our board member. And Augusta Staras, please come, lead band member. And I will sit also, if you don't mind. Okay, so I will start with a very short intro so the people we have on the stage today. So uh, Augusta Staras is a Litvan member from the very beginning of the organization. He is uh, a business angel. He has 12 years experience in building, managing, and growing online and consumer businesses. Uh, Vladas Lashas, chairman of the board at Litvan, serial investor, business angel, philanthrope, entrepreneur, and many, many more words I could say but I'm just afraid that we'll run out of the time if we'll start to talk about his achievements. And Rita Sakos, board member at Litban, angel investor, focusing on international and business development. And Rita is a very active member at Litban, and she helps to build business angels community here in Lithuania a lot. And Arvid Stromskis, managing partner at Business Angels Fund, over 10 years of experience in private equity and fund management, startups and SME investment and business development, and many years of experience in, in management consulting. And Arvdas is also a board member at Litban. So I will kick off with the first question for all of you. So please grab a mic. And um, keeping in mind that nowadays we have uh, many, many places where to raise money, starting from public grants and ending with the private money as an investment, how do you think why a startup should consider the opportunity to raise money from angel investors? Um, what are the advantages on having business angel as an investor? Uh, okay, so everyone's pointing to me, I'll start. Um, I think uh, angels uh, provide a uh, very good starting point for a business because usually they're very well connected people in the community. So they're able to make uh, helpful connections for the businesses that are starting up. 
Business angels also are looking um, at investing. They understand what they're investing in, and that is that your business is super high risk at the stage that they're going in. And so they are likely looking at your company from slightly different lens than, let's say, a venture capital company would be. So perhaps due diligence requirements and things like that are um, slightly at ease. Uh, they probably don't require as solid an MVP or otherwise uh, some kind of proof of concept or, or let's say some kind of sales track as uh, a venture capital company would, and that would be at a later stage. So I'd say from my perspective, those are probably some of the advantages why you'd want to uh, select uh, business angels as your first investors in a company. Also, I have to say that um, as investors, angels don't always require um, equity at the stage that they're investing in. They might um, settle for, and now more usually than not, a convertible loan, which um, means that they take um, some kind of, uh, they'll, they'll extend a loan to you, uh, and then uh, in, in hopes that when a venture capital company does come in, they'll do the valuation on your company uh, in order to then transfer your loan into equity at a later stage. So. I, I just wanted to add that angels act fast. That's quick decision without any board approval. They coming in and uh, that's his own personal decision and also there's a lot personal touch, advice, empathy, and it's uh, the, the, the business angel. You can have a long journey together if you share from the beginning the vision and they are more patient than formal funds which, had some, which have some restrictions from the beginning, the, the business angel can accept the, all, all the changes in, in your vision and or, or, or business model. And at the end of the day, it's, it's marathon. You need coach for that. It's not sprint. You just finish in, in, in short run. And uh, as everybody coach, helps a lot, and especially if that coach has a lot of expertise in the area which you are entering in. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so just to add to, to the colleagues um, on a topics like uh, why company needs a business angel, um, first of all, I think um, let's uh, forget, not forget that uh, your mom can be a first business angel. Uh, this is a first step always uh, is looking at uh, financing at uh, friends or family uh, and, and probably you go to the next level where you look at uh, business angels uh, with your journey progressing. Uh, to add to the flexibility uh, topic, um, meaning that uh, angels always provide this um, um, kind of support to you, uh, meaning if you have a right match uh, with a business angel, uh, and he buys into your, as a founder vision, uh, he, he, his kind of primary motivation is not profit, uh, I would say, but is to support you uh, going forward. Uh, so his, his, if you align this interest uh, in a good way, so you'll have a very strong support um, in the beginning, uh, which is always the hardest uh, point of a journey, of your startup journey. Uh, so having this, uh, um, as Lada said, a coach uh, will help you kind of navigate this, um, this sprinting the marathon. Uh, I would say uh, it, it's, it's really tough, tough in the beginning. So uh, looking at a kind of business angel perspective, um, having one on board um, will help you uh, strongly in the beginning. Uh. Why do you talk English? Because <laughs> we have English people on board. Right. Uh, just a couple, couple of comments, just slightly to build on what you're saying, is that funds do not invest in very early stages. So that's, it's really, it's really Angel who is taking a risk and, and who is taking a lot of cooperation with a, with a startup. 
And you know, having uh, not exactly 10, but over 20 years of experience and in directly invested in through funds and privately over 60 companies, I can, I can say one thing that uh, life of startup fundamentally is a sprint. I do not see it as a, as a marathon. Uh, sprint meaning that you, know, you run from failure to failure, from failure to failure, till you find your modus operandi, which you know, gives, you, gives you, how to say, sustainable growth. Then you are, I mean, you are turning this whole bunch of sprints into marathon, which turns out into life or whatever. So angel is really is really first step what you do, and when you are considering investments, I would I would just skip a funds, go straight to the angel and start to finding finding cooperation with angel. I mean, it turns out to be much more profitable a logical way for startup to start life instead of you know going from fund to fund you know and and, and ending up with nothing really, really. And our fund is exactly direct directed to supporting and cooperating with the funds, with the angels, and then by that cooperation we are, we are able to bring uh, a steady and constant growth to the companies. So. Thank you. Uh, Rita, maybe you could answer with this question. When, I mean, at what startup stage is the best time to start raising angel investment? How do you think? Uh, so, if we take the stages of a startup, usually you have a great idea. Maybe then you go out and you find a co-founder and you start to grow this idea yourself. And so maybe you're bootstrapping or maybe you're borrowing from the category of uh, investor or lender that Remigius referred to as, uh, as, as uh, friends uh, or family, or there's a third one, fools, who might be throwing money into your, your idea, a great idea at this first stage. So um, once you've gotten a little bit of traction with this first stage, you've put a business plan together, um, you know, you've, you've developed this further, you understand the market that you're going after, um, you have an idea of who you need uh, in order to construct this business, which kind of players you need, what kind of sales team maybe you need, what kind of marketing you need. Um, then I'd say that at that stage, that's when you start to maybe look for angels. And um, just to go off of what um, Arvidas had said about uh, venture capital and angels and venture capital not investing, I think that there's a trend now where venture capital is starting to invest at earlier and earlier stages. And some venture capital companies, even here in Lithuania, have accelerators that they've started or incubators that they've started in order to uh, grab these great ideas and these great companies at a very early stage. And then if you hit all those miles, stones that they construct together with you for your company, then perhaps they'll put money in at a venture capital stage, let's say. But um, in most deals, what I find is venture capital companies, even the earlier stage ones, will say, okay, go out and find yourself business angels, and once you have angel investment, then come back and talk to us. So I guess, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I think, you know, that's kind of roughly the stage where you'd start to look for business angels. And then also perhaps find someone in the industry that you're interested in going after, obviously, so you can reap the rewards of those contacts that I was mentioning earlier. Maybe any, anyone to add something to Rita? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so the question for all of you now, the top three things you as a business angel look for in a company before investing? Actually, I, I look for the team, founder or founders, and uh, if, if that is uh, chemistry which is aligning with my values and uh, personality, and uh, I, I look for that at very first, and the idea or the focus for the uh, business they are starting is, is secondary. And even these things happening, like you, you, you are looking for the people 
who are doing interesting things, even non-profit, like uh, Alex told examples, uh, my investments, actually, I, I, I can tell a short story, for example, for the, I, I've been working for a long time, TEDx Vilnius team, and when one of our uh, organizer team, Mindo Gaseglinskas, uh, I knew him as a lecturer, as a very well and team member, and then when he started the company, I became first business angel because I knew, I trusted him, I saw what he can do even for non-profit, just voluntary, volunteering in the team for the TEDx Vilnius, and then all these things are more these secondary when you see personality and align with their values and uh, purposes in, in life. Yeah, I can just continue basically <coughs> on that idea. It's, yeah, it's a team. It's a team, team, team. But it's not just a team. I would say it's the genetics of a team. Uh, what we are trying to, to look and understand, you know, what drives these people in a team, why the hell they are doing this, this crazy thing which is unprofitable for first two to three years, and a team's ability to grow, team's ability to learn new things. I mean, startup fundamentally is, is about constantly learning new things. And a team is able to do uh, work internationally, so somebody who doesn't speak at least a couple of foreign languages, I would say unqualified for investments. I mean, we are working, most of our companies, even Lithuanian companies, are working across the border. A go good common English language is, it's, I mean, it's not a foreign language any longer, I can tell you. I mean, just a working language and basically that's it. Please have learned more languages, like you know, Polish, I mean, our biggest neighbor. Uh, learn German, one of our biggest clients for all our industry. I mean, learn languages. And what we, I'm, I'm just addressing this very openly because I see a number of people who do not really speak foreign languages. I mean, it might be a surprise for everyone. I do see a lot of people who do not read uh, magazines, who are just browsing on a phone and, uh, and saying that we've learned something. It's not, it's not. You know, you have to learn advanced technologies from magazines and books. And it's what we are looking at. It's not, it's not just, uh, just a team, it's the genetics of a team. Ability to grow, a fundamental requirement for the team, from our perspective at least. I'll, I'll, I'll just add, you know, I think uh, all these things resonate um, when, when angels or funds are looking uh, at the teams or investment propositions. Um, I personally add uh, one more thing that is important for me is I look at the founder's journey uh, or story. Uh, how did they get up to this point? Uh, what are their kind of learnings? How much did they kind of put effort into coming into this moment? Did they? sacrifice, did they learn a lot, or did they build something before which kind of gave a new lessons, new, uh, new insights, and etc. So I think this journey uh, and being able to clearly and concisely explain how you come up uh, up till this moment and how did you arrive at this moment when you're talking to the business angel uh, really helps kind of to connect, uh, kind of to buy in uh, and understand better what's your motivation. Because as we heard today, profit is not key driver nowadays. Uh, it has to be this mission, founding mission. Uh, we are entrepreneurs and we are here to change the world. So uh, helping uh, angels and funds with your story uh, will help you kind of to understand uh, and, and uh, probably convince them better. Uh, it's not a cheap trick, uh, but it's, it's a good way to kind of find a match uh, with a business angel? Three things. Track record. I want to see if you failed, and I want to see how you got out of your failure. I'd like to see motivation. What motivates you to get up in the morning, and what's going to make me believe that you're going to persevere and keep on with what, what it is that you're doing? Because ultimately, 
Um, you know, there's too many scenarios, I think, of people giving up way too early, and then, you know, this ends up being uh, uh, for naught. So um, I think that, that hurts uh, business angels, that hurts the trust that business angels are trying to build with uh, the startup community. So I think those are my three main things. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, what are typical reasons angel investors will reject the opportunity to invest? So, I, out of the you mentioned that uh, not knowing languages, for example, anything else to add? Um, many, 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 many reasons. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I mean, the question, question should be rather, rather said why, why funds are investing or why angels are investing. On every year we reject at least 50 to 60 proposals. And uh, there are many, many reasons for rejection, but uh, I don't really concentrate. In some cases, simply team is unable, unable to deliver. In some cases, you no, know, it's very clear that the team is, is not able to grow outside the territory. We are building some small wooden houses which are needed only around here in Nemencine, and it's not a fund investment. We recently rejected investment, investment uh, simply because, <clears throat> because a fund, an angel is not needed. We sit down and worked a little bit on finances, did internal financial engineering, and it was evident that, that if fund or somebody else invests, I mean, it doesn't make sense for them. I mean, there are, Many, many reasons, I would say, yeah. Probably too many copycats. Everyone wants to be the next Uber of, or the next Google of, or the next whatever, be your own. The other thing is uh, hearing too much about these grand size markets that you're going after. The market is 20 billion, and if we take just 1% of 1%. So I think I need a better understanding of the market that you're going after, and I need to understand how you feel that you're gonna go after the market, because the number one place, I think, where most startups fail and fall flat on their faces is sales. And if you're not making sales, you're not building a business. So it's a realistic feet on the ground understanding of what it is you're pursuing. Of course, you need a little bit of magic to motivate and, and to go after what it is that, that you think that, uh, that, that the market is going to want. But um, realism, I think, that you know, you're not going to be making 300 million in the next two years. I would say that usually business angels, they, they see they are selecting best of the best. So investment coming only for the one, two, three percent of the applications or, or the startups, teams you, you meet, you hear or, or discuss, and then you select only the best. And that's many reasons to not to invest. You have to have a very strong reason to invest. And that's uh, always I'm looking if I really can add something to, to them, not only money, but something more important from different perspectives, what can make them more successful. And that relates things, what I am interested in, what I am doing myself, what is relevant to my background, to my network, all these things are mattering. And if I can not do anything more except just giving money, that is not, not my purpose to invest into the startup. Um, yeah, I think um, because typically business angels invest their own money, uh, it's not funds, right, um, in money. So one thing really helps to convince is that you show some uh, traction in your sales. Uh, so basically you're already in a position where you convinced some customers either to sign up uh, any agreement with you or, or even a promise to pay uh, for your services or for your product. Uh, it's again very realistic uh, approach, uh, but we are realistic <laughs> investors, I think, on, on a broader sense. Um, I think, this, um, in general, um, 
if you put your own, if you put uh, in your business angel shoes, um, there is something of a feeling uh, that the feeling is not right. Uh, that sometimes uh, or most times is why you reject investment or you reject a team. Um, and it, it, it happens, I guess, to, to all of you, if you go through your life uh, and someone comes along and offers you to come somewhere, right? You sometimes say no, just because it doesn't feel right. So there's some element of magic or, or just feeling. Um, we we typically think that investment is very rational, but it's not. It's, it's just emotions. A lot of emotions is involved, and the feeling you get from the team um, being in the right moment, uh, in the right timing, is, is, is that, that changes a lot as well. Thank you. Uh, Vlade, as private investor, private individual, you invested really a lot. Um, could you share with us a little practical information? How much angel investor invests in a company? What are typical round sizes, etc.? I would say from my personal perspective, usually I invest uh, from 10,000 to 50,000. Maybe together it could be a bigger ticket if, if we uh, do investment several business angels and uh, that could be also some kind of multiplication with the Coinvest fund, which is also a very, very good opportunity for the, start, uh, for the startups in, in Lithuania to, to combine business angels and uh, Coinvest uh, fund investment from the, for the very beginning. And I think uh, sometimes uh, uh, you, you, you're looking for advice and uh, actually you, you need to get a person who is uh, important for your team, for your network. Usually you always know these persons. You need to, to go to them and convince, not only be advisor, but to, to be business angel. To, because uh, advising and helping uh, startup is one thing, but when you connect with investment, you feel much more responsible and you, with the investment, you also evaluate your, your, your possibilities to dedicate some time to, to help that startup. That is very important and I think also when you are coming to, actually I, I, as everybody we have a limited time for the everything what we do and uh, one thing when I see the startup, they are quite agile or just uh, they, if they haven't got the meeting, they are continuing to, to, to ask you to meet. You, you see that they are very agile and selling very good their, their startup for the business angel that also some kind of estimate what they are doing in in the future what they will do by selling their product thank you and uh, i have one question for rita but i hope that everyone else will add anything too so rita you've been leading investors syndicates uh, many times right uh, how much equity should an angel investor get? This, I get this question all the time from the startups. How would you answer it? Help me. It depends. I don't know. It's, it's a hard, it's, it's a tough uh, answer because um, you know, it, really, it, it does, it depends. But I'd say a, kind of a good size for an angel or an angel syndicate would be between, let's say, 10 and 30% of, of a deal as an angel in, in, in kind of seed, seed financing. But I mean, it, again, it, it's, it's, a, it's a tough question. I'd say, you know, for seed financing, anywhere from 10 to 30 is probably a, is a good amount of equity. But I've, prob I've invested actually where I've gotten 1%. I've invested where I've gotten, you know, less than 2%. And, um, and I mean, I was happy. It was maybe a bit of a later stage deal. Um, and, um, you know, our syndicate maybe wasn't putting in all that much money. 
But, uh, and, and again, to Vlado's point on, on how much uh, people are putting into an, a, a deal, let's say, if, if it's a syndicate, which means it's a group of investors that have come together to invest in a particular company, then the size of investment can be as little as 2,000 to, let's say, you know, 10,000 to 25,000 to 50,000. So it depends on what your first um, raise of capital is and um, how long that capital is going to last you for because people are investing for you know six months short term they're investing for 12 months uh, they're investing for you know uh, to see a company through 18 months and as founders you're constantly having to not only drive the business but think about how you're going to raise your next round of funding as well so it's a very important topic for for founders i feel but yeah from the equity side that would be my answer Uh, yeah, yeah, sort of, sort of agree here. But no, one has to understand really one thing. I mean, no one is pay, is going to be paid in percentages. Everybody is going to get paid in cash. So uh, it's not about percentages. Uh, it's about it's about you know uh, cooperation in the first stage. But no, up, amounts of shares is enough for to establish cooperation. Uh, but there is one fundamental but. When angel or early stage investor has got a very large chunk of shares, and now depending on a deal structure, let's assume it's non-diluted, which means that you know, percentage cannot go down at a later stage when the big money of venture capital is coming, that could restrict venture capital entry into company which means that the company will stop growing and actually probably most likely will disappear. So, you know, one has to, making a first, first stage investment, one has to think all the way through what happens when large companies or large investors are coming and how the whole thing is structured. So the first deal, it, from my perspective, is very, very important but not to restrict big investors, but allow angels to earn 10, 20, 30 times their investment. It's what we are looking for, fundamentally. Um, very, very well articulated points uh, on, uh, on the mechanics. Uh, I'll again, I touch a little bit on um, emotional side, but um, any investment deal you do with uh, angels is basically a marriage. Um, and you typically think a marriage of two persons, it's in equal shares uh, or equal parts, right? Uh, that's not the case uh, when you think of it, funding a startup, uh, but I think in general you have to feel comfortable uh, by giving X amount of percent or, you know, of your startup. Uh, so if you don't feel comfortable, that means something is wrong. Uh, so you have to kind of think through again. Uh, but basically, it helps to kind of go forward. If you have this kind of friction in the, in, in, in the beginning of your journey, uh, when you think that you gave up too much or gave too little, um, that, that doesn't help. Uh, because um, as any marriage, uh, it has ups and downs, as, as was said today. So I would feel, uh, I would say that you, f you have to kind of feel uh, one thing and um, talk to probably guys and girls who already did this uh, in, in the other startups. They usually have a lot of experience um, in this early moments of a company and a funding of company. Uh, so you should get advice from a different perspective, from their point of view, what worked, what didn't work, uh, and how would they do it differently if they do it differently next time. Thank you. Okay, so these were the questions I usually get why I work at, uh, work at Lithuanian Business Angel Network. Thank you for helping me to answer it <laughs> in public. And now we have 10 minutes, and uh, I think we sh probably should give the opportunity for the audience. Maybe they have the questions. Switch my microphone, thank you. Yes, of course. So futurepreneurs, you have got an angel blessing and thank you for your questions. We will right away ask them. So uh, what about how big investments can be done by one business angel and syndicate? Uh, how big investments can be done by one business angel or syndicates? 
Could you please? Yeah, so uh, the investments can, can, can be large as well. I mean, there are, there are angels that do very large investments, over 100,000 and more. Um, it's just, you know, your, your business case has to be pretty solid for mm -hmm. that, and it's very rare to find people like that. But I think now um, there's a fund in Lithuania called Co-Invest Fondas that um, actually helps business angels uh, come up with the money needed for, let's say, whatever the first uh, seed financing would be. And so they're able to uh, provide those funds uh, as long as you know there's an understanding uh, and, and a belief in, in the business and, and in the team and, and so on and so forth. So they can come up with a very large size of, of money. So the angels, let's say, in syndicate form would maybe invest 30% of whatever the deal is and then co-invest would help by funding 70% of the deal. So, uh, you know, it varies, but there's definitely... And I just wanted to mention one thing because I, I think, um, you know, there's, there's a lot... There's a lot of information on the web, obviously, about you know how how to do a deal, how to structure a deal, and the types of things that you know futurepreneurs are probably very interested in. But uh, there's one podcast that's called Deal Makers that's very good, and it provides a lot of good concrete examples of how these deals all come together at an early stage. So you might want to look that up. Thank you. There is a question to all the participants. Um, do angels have a business type they cheer on? Uh, yeah. uh, well, what makes you cheer on? What, is, uh, what could be the type of the business? Yeah? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. For example, my education, my PhD was computer vision. I invested in two startups which are dealing with the artificial intelligence and analytics like Pixavia, Oxypit. But uh, Actually, I cheer also about the new things, innovation, which is making impact. And that's not always at the very beginning startup, just brilliant team or just personality, talented one who wants to educate himself or herself. I help on education. I help teams to work on nonprofits like uh, for example, 10 years ago, Lithuania was not related to space in any way in technology and with some few similar-minded entrepreneurs, we, we initiated that two teams finally designed CubeSats and these were launched almost without any state support, mostly from the crowdfunded and funded by the like entrepreneurs, but that wasn't at the beginning like vision for the business and that was more for the change, impact, and now we have already worldwide known nanoavionics, which was bought from the, even from the venture capital, bought by, by American company. And myself, as I already know that area, I am investor in, in one pan-European startup, which is leading British space program, Orbex.space. And I was also founding Business Angel because I already knew working with the talented people, I knew the teams and the people who are really passionate about that. And I knew that whom I can trust so don't think that you need business model and that just revenue and Google was started without any business model for the profit and revenue. And you can do something like competing in the global scale with some innovative technologies, uh, doing something for fun, and then something emerges if you have brilliant talented team. Of course, it's very important to enjoy what you're doing. And I see that Rita is really already ho holding the microphone. So what cheers Europe? What type of businesses is your favorite? 
So I look for businesses with very unique selling points and innovative businesses as well, but I also try to support women entrepreneurs. So I look at women who are, you know, actually going out there and, and trying to, to solve some problem in, in the world. And, and I really love to see that because I think that there's still a lack of women entrepreneurs and there's still a lack of women um, venture capitalists and there's still a lack of women angels. And so I think that um, we all need to kind of pull ourselves up and, and support each other and, and make sure that, that we're, we're out there also, so. Thank you, Augustus. <laughs> yeah, applause. <laughs> well done. So, are you ready? <laughs> uh, my, my kind of background is financial technology, fintech. Um, so just one word, blockchain. Thank you. And Arvidas? Uh, I like growth. I mean, if it's driven by ladies, I mean, it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> One more round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. That was tough. You know, what is the most difficult question? The person uh, from entrepreneurs or the business angels probably could answer. I think that together uh, with Charlotte, we discussed it yesterday. What is your favorite startup? That could be probably the hardest thing. But maybe you would like to share some names. Favorite startup? As I mentioned, Pixavia on the computer vision, just uh, automated shop analytics. Uh. Good. Anyone else? No. Okay, it's hard. But you will have time to think about it. So I think we can thank you for the panelists. Thank you, Daiva. Thank you so much. Please applaud. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. So what an inspiring uh, first half of the day. Uh, and I think the next part of the day will be even more interesting because in the second part of the day, you will form teams. Isn't it excited? It's probably the thing which you have waited for a long time already. And you will start right away to develop ideas, which is as well very exciting. And we are approaching the coffee break, uh, but first let me get you, while I'm still here, some technical information that sharp at 12.30, you'll need to get back here to the first floor uh, where the teams will be formed, as I mentioned. And uh, uh, now, uh, let me ask you one question. Do you feel the inspiration? Yeah, I see. Yes, thank you. I see them. Yeah, futurepreneurs. Let's start the working. So, I believe that you will even surprise yourself in the shape of the program. And I think that you need to start from the coffee break and the networking session, which is, which is the perfect exercise to ask all these questions that I haven't uh, said out loud from the stage, but you will be able to ask them uh, during the networking. So the coffee break is powered by Coinvestitsinius Fondas in cooperation with private investors, venture capital funds, and group of business angels. So they invest into startups and support the uh, undergoing business development and growth. So let me thank you one more time for being so welcoming audience. I was so excited and I need to admit so nervous that my voice is still shaking, but I believe that I will get better and I will meet you soon. And I think that in the up upcoming Wednesday, we could meet at Rocket where you will have the first session in our home of FinTech and innovation. And please note that you are very welcome to contact me as a mentor and let's do something great together. So thank you so much. Enjoy the coffee break. Enjoy the rest half of the day and surprise yourself. Thank you. Thank you.